Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Chamberlain. For those of you that don't know me, in addition to being today's host, I also lead the global sales and marketing teams here at Merix. Merix is a leader in providing audiovisual solutions for the modern workplace. For over 70 years, we have helped organizations leverage ever-changing business communication solutions to solve problems and to grow. With our global presence, Verix is proud to help organizations use their current audiovisual solutions to meet an entirely new set of business challenges. Our panelists on today's webinar bring a cohesive view of the dynamics unfolding across the globe and how audiovisual technology is helping. To start, I'd like to introduce Akeen Adewale. Akeen is our senior design engineer based out of our corporate headquarters and has spent 24 years in networking and audiovisual solutions. His expertise in working the AV trifecta, including consulting, manufacturing, and integration has given him a unique perspective to solutions while working with our largest enterprise clients. Welcome, McKean. Hey, good morning, Bill. Hey, good morning. Next, I'd like to introduce James Giddens, our senior project engineer. James brings 15 years of international experience, including working out of Sydney, London, New York, and now based in Los Angeles. Serving a wide, wide and wild range of client segments, James has vast experience integrating numerous soft conferencing and unified communication solutions that are key for clients that have diverse locations and office footprints. Good morning, James. Good morning, Bill. And last but certainly not least, we are thankful that Ben Dandola Grubb, Varix's Assistant Vice President of Engineering Services, is with us again today. For those that have joined our previous webinars, you know that Ben brings both technical knowledge on the intricacies of AV systems and a tremendous real, real world experience designing solutions. In addition to moderating, Ben will be taking on a more active role as a panelist today so that we can tap into that knowledge. Welcome, Ben. Good morning. Thanks, Bill. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Teams, Zoom, and WebEx, Varix Tells All. Today, we're going to focus on these, these top three corporate platforms, including the differences, features, and interoperability. Before we start with the main topic, I wanted to go over a few quick administrative details. First, we are recording today's session and we'll make a replay available afterwards. Also, there will be a Q&A period towards the end of the webinar. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type in any of your questions. If we don't get to your questions today's session, someone will reach out to you afterwards. Ben, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get this kicked off. Sounds good. Thank you, Bill. Let's start off by defining the differences between a room system and the software or the application for video conferencing that you're accustomed to running on your laptop. So we have pretty much all been working from home for probably pushing six months now, and you've been running Zoom on your laptop, Teams on your laptop, WebEx on your laptop, and that is your personal device. The flip side is a room system. You've probably all heard of a Zoom room, a Microsoft Teams room, or a WebEx room. And so if you're in a Zoom room, you can join Zoom calls. You send invites, you join it natively, and it all works great. Same thing for Microsoft Teams and for WebEx. So it's a room system which is based on a codec or a hardware or a computer. And I'm thinking of computers nowadays as codecs, if it's a Zoom room or a Teams room. And you're running the software, and it's dedicated to that one application, and you can join your Zoom calls, Team calls, WebEx calls. Now, I'm gonna move us straight into calendar integration. So James, would you start us off with the background of calendar integration, why we should care about it and use it? Yeah, well, um, calendar integration is basically a simple and effective means of how we manage our calls within our uh, personal schedules or a room schedule. So from the individual des uh, or desktop perspective, the calendar integration is essentially, you know, syncing a calendar with one or several of your platforms. Um, so you can easily access that call, usually by a hyperlink in, in a meeting listing. Um, from the room perspective, a calendar resource is allocated to the room and then synced to the platform. And as you can see on the screen there on the slide, meetings are presented like in a, in a scrolling list um, on the user interface, whether it be a touch panel or, or whatever. Um, and the good thing about that is it usually offers a one touch join button, as you can see there. So um, can also be paired with an external display like scheduling panel to show the current and upco upcoming meetings, um, which we're seeing more of. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think to simply reiterate, there's a calendar associated with your conference room. If I want to schedule a meeting, I send an invite to James and Akeen, and I also send the invite to that conference room. 
and then the join button appears on the controller or the touch panel in that conference room so that you can walk in and start your meeting. So to me, the biggest benefit here of Calendar integration is that you have a fast start to your meeting. It's no longer fumbling around for five to 10 minutes trying to figure out what IP address do I type in or what contact list do I need to go to? Just hit the join button and you're right. in. Yep, nice and clean. And it saves a lot of time with that initial, like, you know, just establishing the call. That's Yep, and then all three platforms have the same offering of a one touch join button once you come into that conference room. Um, so let's talk for a few minutes. Akeen, a lot of the fake folks out there may not want to be touching a touch panel if we're worried about COVID-19 and shared technology touch surfaces. Could you give us a little bit more in depth about what it might mean to have a no touch join? Yeah, so like every single you know, platform, they, they all have their sort of uh, no touch join, I think. Um, you know, the last one we'll talk about, which is WebEx, is the one that's probably most intentional. Um, I think the, uh, you know, both uh, teams in Zoom have been kind of trying to figure it out a little bit um, as things have been developing with regards to the pandemic and so forth. Um, but each of them, you know, have, do have some capabilities with regards to no touch join. For teams in particular, um, you know, if you're on Teams and you want to do a no touch join, right now the way that you can do it is by joining uh, a meeting ad hoc from your device. Uh, so if you're putting Teams um, on your, uh, your desktop within the app on your desktop, it will look for rooms that are nearby to join. If the room is registered and available on your network, then you can actually add that meeting along with your device into that, that team room. Um, <clears throat> for Zoom, right now, the only way to really do it um, is with uh, an iPad. Um, iPad, generally speaking, with Zoom seem to have the most, um, the, seem to be the most feature rich, they have the most functionality. So with an iPad, you know, you can actually say, hey, Zoom, start my meeting. Um, and then you'll be able to join um, your Zoom meeting without touch. Uh, for WebEx, um, and they've been doing this for a little while now, um, they've been using high pitch frequency, um, which is heard by your phone or laptop. So where you're actually within the room, you know, the codec is putting out, you know, high pitch frequency um, and it's um, encoded with the IP address of that device, so, or of the codec. So when your laptop um, or your, your tablet hears that, it basically will say, oh, I recognize this codec, I recognize the IP address, I recognize that I'm supposed to be in a meeting now, and then it will sync up over the network and allow you to actually join that meeting without touching anything. So those are kind of like the three three ways that, that's currently being done right now. I'm, I'm curious to see how Teams and Zoom will further, further develop that. And one of the cool things that I did with WebEx is run the WebEx app on my phone because similar no touch join you can do from the desktop WebEx app or the phone app. So I walked into the room, my phone sees the codec using this high pitch frequency, which they call proximity. I can select to join from this, the room system, but then from my phone, I then have meeting controls from my phone. So I can mute, hit the mute button on my phone. It changed the microphone LEDs to red. It indicated on the WebEx call, it's now muted. And I could also end that call from my phone, which is pretty cool. Um, from the team side, and I just wanted to add a little detail here that they're using Bluetooth beaconing between the computer that's running that Microsoft Teams room and your device, whether that's your phone or, or your laptop. So as long as you have Bluetooth enabled, and it's not pairing, it's just beaconing. So it's just sending out that signal. Um, and as Akeen was saying, it establishes the communication either through initially that high pitch frequency, which would be WebEx, or Bluetooth to say, yes, the device is here. And that's how they achieve level of security because um, a high pitch frequency can't pass through walls. So I have to be in the room to be able to join that WebEx call. Um, but once we establish that baseline security level, yes, Ben is actually here in the room. Then it all switches over to ethernet IP traffic for the actual communication happening there. But I think this also rolls us nicely into wireless content share because this is one of the baseline features that all three of these platforms offer. And James, would you start us off here? Give us a little insight. Yeah, so uh, as you just sort of alluded to, like all three of them offer the same sort of thing. And um, for Teams and, and WebEx, they kind of, they use the same technology to establish the call. Um, sorry, for, for the content sharing. Um, so it's, it's really difficult to separate them all. Um, the, obviously like the, the culture of the conferencing uh, determines, you know, uh, the best use case as well. 
um, and what method you should use. So wireless is, is becoming more prominent and more popular, but we're still seeing some, you know, well, a lot of the, the hard cabled option, it's still very important. I guess I would say more than 50, well, more than 50% of conference rooms also still have a backup wired HDMI connection. Right. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, there is, you know, obviously from, from these big players, a push for wireless as, you know, BYOD is becoming a, um, more common as well. Um, so that provides a bit more flexibility. I think from this, if we call this a competition, which it's not, um, I would give the winner to Zoom in the sense that if I'm using an iPad and it works best with an iPad, you walk into the Zoom room and if you hit that screen, that share screen button on your laptop, it is almost instantaneous where it presents your image, your desktop image from your laptop on screen in the Zoom. It doesn't, has nothing to do with the call. You could be in a call and it'll do it the same or not. Um, but it's very, very fast, the, the fastest out of the three. Uh, Cisco proximity works pretty well. Uh, I would give, I would put Microsoft Teams on the low end of the tier here. It's fine and it works, absolutely works. Um, but you're essentially creating an ad hoc meeting that only you are in, and then you're presenting your desktop. And I would, and know, I would wager too, just that, you know, as, as the wireless content sharing, the, that connectivity becomes much more fluid and much, um, it, it's a lot faster, you know, that, you know, hardware connections, you know, at least when coming from a conference table standpoint, you know, I know that I feel more comfortable not having to necessarily touch, you know, a cable on the table. So, you know, as these different platforms start to develop that sort of connectivity and make it much easier, much faster for you to take your BYOD device and actually connect to uh, a, a platform for content sharing that we may see, you know, we may see that table connectivity, at least based on the, the time that we're currently in, kind of, you know, stay on the sideline for, for, for some time. Yep. That makes perfect sense. And I think it's worth noting that all these platforms do support a hardwired HDMI or other flavor uh, of video input that can be wired. Mm -hmm. And any of these platforms can be built into a small, simple system or the most, or the largest and the most robust system. You can have a full HD base T matrix. You can have a full AV over IP virtual matrix with essentially an unlimited number of sources all boiling down to a single USB cable um, that can work in your Zoom room, in your Teams room, in your WebEx, a little different because it's not all based on USB, but it's the same idea. You know, the most, the largest systems absolutely will work. <laughs> Let's talk for a few minutes about a few more of the features. Uh, Akeen, I'll go put it back to you here to start us off. Yeah, like, you know, when it comes to these feature sets, you know, uh, you know all these different platforms, you know, They've been doing some of these things that we have listed here for quite some time now, but um, I think we just want to kind of uh, make note of them in case it's something that you have kind of blown by or haven't really seen before. But whiteboarding and annotation is something that all these different platforms have as a feature set, and they've been doing it for quite some time. Um, PTZ camera control, um, you know, interestingly enough, you know, <laughs> uh, when we were playing around with this uh, in, a, in a call uh, 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 last week, you're able to actually um, uh, allow someone else to do bar camera control, you know, so. You know, and that was more, on Zoom and that was a little scary when we first. It, it was a little scary. Path. It was very scary in the, in the sense that the person whose camera I was controlling, they couldn't get control back of their camera. So that could just be some, some sort of a, you know, a feature that needs to be kind of worked out on the Zoom side or whatever. But the capability is there. You did, you did have the ability to connect to their camera remotely do a pan up and down, left and right, and also zoom in and out. Um, and likewise, you know, if somebody has USB camera, um, a USB camera that's that's connected that has PTZ functionality, you'd be able to do, to do the same sort of thing in terms of taking over that camera and, and controlling. And it. I'll throw out a quick note so before people get scared. If yeah. you're the host or the moderator of a call, I can turn your camera off. I can mute you. I can't unmute you and I can't turn your camera back on. It'll give you a note. It'll say, Ben would like you to turn your camera on, yes or no. It's never yeah. going to turn your camera. I can't control someone else's camera in terms of turning it off and turning it back on. I, there's that level of security, fortunately. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, fortunately. Um, uh, viewing options. So with regards to viewing options, you know, each of these different platforms have been, um, you know, coming up with, you know, some better ways, you know, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later on with regards to BC fatigue. Um, but in particular, viewing options are, you know, how you see your, your participants in your call, whether they're on the top or on the side. Um, for um, uh, for teams in particular, they just came out something called together mode, um, and we we played played around, played around with it for a little bit. You know, it basically does like a cutout of each individual person in a call and did like a stadium style seating 
Um, and, it, and it's pretty cool. It makes, it keeps the call a little bit more interesting and a little bit more fun. Um, it, that may actually be a feature that they're, they're working on because I don't, I'm not quite sure if it's currently available right now. Like we had it and then they took it back and then. As far as I can tell, they turned it off again. Yeah. So we're, we're waiting, we're, we're waiting with bated breath for, <laughs> for the, uh, to, you know, altogether feature to come back. Um, and then also, um, say for instance, with teams, um, you know, they have very much kind of like, almost like, um, like an iPhone, if you, if you ever notice on an iPhone, you know, they have this sort of like pul pulsing and sort of pumping and breathing where they're trying to give focus to the person who's on, who's speaking and that, and that will actually enlarge. The blur, every, you know, is that what you're saying? Smaller. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, um, you know, so, and, and that's not necessarily one of my, my favorites, you know, I think overall, I think Tunes is Teams, if I'm speaking of this person, the Teams is probably my favorite in terms, I mean, um, Zoom is probably my favorite in terms of the way they lay things out. Um, but yeah, each platform is trying to get creative with, you know, how they're presenting. Well, they're you know, competing they're against one another and they're enhancing. It's a continually evolving solution in the platform. So one of the more recent Zoom updates that happened over the past couple of weeks enabled a number of people to have virtual backgrounds without a green screen for the very first time. Because, you know, two months ago, three months ago, their PCs were not powerful enough in terms of the video card to support that. But Zoom streamlined things in terms of the requirements from your actual computer. So now a bunch of people can do virtual backgrounds for the first time. And, and I think it's worth noting that all three platforms do offer virtual backgrounds. Six months ago, WebEx didn't have it. They do today. And then it was first enabled and there was a couple options. And then later on, they added the feature of adding your own so you can choose. You know, Right now we're using Varric's wallpaper as our virtual background. Um, it's nice to be able to do that. Yeah, no, it just makes it a little bit more fun. You know, when you're on calls, you know, especially as, as we are right now with the pandemic, we're on calls pretty much all day long. This is how we communicate. So um, with regards to people counting, so with people counting, um, it, that, that's an interesting um, feature, um, primarily that WebEx and Zoom really has. On the WebEx side, uh, it actually counts people at the camera level. So you can actually be in a call and WebEx will count the number of people that are in a specific space in a specific room. You can actually share that, that data in real time, uh, which is very, very useful, you know, so for providing updates on who's or the number of people that may be in a conference space at any given point in time. So from a COVID standpoint, you know, and, and making sure that we have a certain number of people within a space, that's great information to have, you know, just to be able to kind of keep track of that. On top of that, you know, from a, a procurement standpoint or a resourcing standpoint, it allows you to see if a room is being utilized as it should be. So if you have an eight person conference room um, and maybe with COVID it's supposed to be a four person conference room, but you, you always only have two people in that room all the time, then you may wanna take a look at how you're utilizing that space and maybe make it into two rooms or whatever the case might be. But a lot, it just gives you that additional information that you can make some some decisions with regards I to think I would argue that WebEx is the most robust and the most limiting at the same time. And mm -hmm. that sounds a little odd to say it that way, but the key clarification here, right, is it's only, since it's based in the camera, not in the codec, mm -hmm. it only works with the Cisco quad cam or the room kit or the room kit mini. Indeed, right, absolutely indeed. You tie any other camera or even a P60 to your codec, you don't have people counting. Yeah, um, and then, the last thing is with, with Zoom. Zoom does people counting, but it does it at the codec level, essentially. It does it on the PC, and it's information that becomes available something like 30 minutes after your call. So it's information you can go back and you can reference and take a look at as far as making decisions concerned, but it's not done in real time. Um, and then sharing that information, pulling it off of that codec um, or off of your PC that's that, that you're using for Zoom, um, it's not as straightforward. It's not like it just ties directly into a workflow like it would with WebEx to the codec to say Fusion or something like that um, in the background. So, but it is data that you can pull off to convert into analytics, right? Yeah. Future um, planning: How many people actually use a room so that I know what types of rooms to build in the future? Exactly. Exactly. Um, phone dialing add-on. I know James. You want? To, I know that you have been, been playing around with that a little bit. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, James? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not as deep as what the people counting is, <laughs> but um, it's it's yeah basically the ability to I think it's mainly for Zoom. Um, they offer a license where you can add in um, you know phone dialing to you know so you can dial a ad hoc a regular telephone number and um, join that to the call. So that's still an important feature to be able to you know although we're 
you know, have easier, the easiest access to video calling we've ever had, um, it's still important to be able to have that traditional telephone connection um, and integrate that into your calls. So yeah, that's, you know, that's probably going to hang around for some time. And it's good to see that, that you know, it's still an option. And that is, like you said, an option. It's not an included feature out of the box. Right. Day one, you buy a Zoom room, Teams room or WebEx room, but it can be added to all three. Can be added if you need it, yeah, which is which is good to have, good option to have. Yeah. Let's, James, let's kick, stick with you for a second. What about hardware kits in terms of, I can buy hardware from any number of manufacturers, but I can't expect my features to be identical across the board. Right. I guess that sort of brings up the native conversation, right? So, um you basically got to ask yourself what what do you want um from it and then that will determine what you can get um so do you want uh, a seamless kind of experience or do you want to save a few bucks and and maybe drop drop a feature or two um mm -hmm. so and i guess some of the examples would be the ipad or the zoom room i can have voice control right. yep no other platform you know, no other controller for zoom can do that right or so you, if i want people counting from webex i'm going to use a quad cam yeah, exactly right. So um, it's it's a bit of a trade off, like like anything. You know, you get what you pay for. So if you if you have a complete ecosystem before one manufacturer or another, then then you're going to get every every uh, feature that's available. So. Yeah, and, and I think one of the newer features that some people are going to love it and some people are going to hate it is the variety of different camera framing um, options, which are done by the cameras themselves. It's nothing to do with the actual Zoom computer room computer or the Cisco codec, right? James, do you have insight there? Um, yeah, so I guess WebEx are great at that, that exact thing um, of camera framing. Um, they, they've been working on that for a long time and it's pretty, pretty good and um, provides a pretty seamless experience. But if you don't go down that route, then it's, it's going to be, you know, and just rely on a static image. It's going to be, a bit, yeah, not as, not as pleasant. Yeah, and, and that idea of camera framing has worked its way all the way down into the $800 plus camera range. It's, it's, it's on the lower end of the price spectrum nowadays, which is great. Right, yeah, especially with some stuff coming out from Poly. Um, the, the automatic camera framing is, is really good from, from our experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's you know, a bit more affordable price point compared to something like you know, the Cisco camera track from the, the larger systems. That's, you know, that's getting up there in terms of cost. I will say I love the image from the quad cam, but you're going to pay for it. Right. Yeah, it, it works great. And it's, you know, it's multiple 4K cameras, you know, combining to, to create one really nice HD. And that's always a trade off too. You know, you're talking about basically optical versus like a digital type of zoom. So if you're dealing with like a speaker track system, we've got, you know, essentially, you know, a P60 camera that's got a, you know, optical zoom up to a certain distance, that's never going to really compete as well with our, our, our optical is always going to be a little bit better than digital, you know, once you get to that point. So right. again, it's like you said, it's a feature trade-off, you know, how much room do you have? How much money do you want to spend? You know, how far away are your participants actually in a call in the first place? You know, so once you take all that in consideration, you can make, you know, an informed decision on which platform to go with. Let's transition into the main part of our conversation here, interoperability. <laughs> James, what is interoperability and what is the CVI? Um, so interoperability, interoperability or interop because interoperability is difficult to say. Um, <laughs> well, most people say interop. Interoperability yeah. is just a full word. <laughs> right. Otherwise it sounds like you're mumbling, you know, which, which I do. <laughs> um, but put simply, it's, it's, the, it's the crosstalk between conferencing platforms, um, usually via a, a cloud service of some type. Um, so the CVI stands for cloud video interoperability, which is the interop license of a platform. So, that so CVI license, is the generic term, right? Yeah. Uh, it's relatively new as well, um, but you'll probably see more of that going forward. And, and that CVI license allows a crosstalk between the platforms. So each platform has its own acronym and you know, more acronyms because we love them. So Zoom has CRC, which is Cloud Room Connector. Uh, WebEx is CMR and uh, Teams. Um, doesn't really have their own acronym, uh, but they at, at, you know, currently they're just using like a third party such as Poly or Pexip, for example. Um, and then, yeah. And so I guess we'll, I'll add there the two we didn't notice note for teams is that up to up to like now, Poly, Pexip, and BlueJeans have offered CVI interrupt for Microsoft Teams. The brand new one out of the gates 
is from WebEx. And right. so I'm excited to see what they're doing because one of the things that we're going to talk about is the functionality and features that you do or don't get when you have an interop license. You know, if I have a Zoom room joining a WebEx call, am I going to be able to do content? Am I going to be able to do whiteboarding or annotation or what do I lose? And it's not going to be fully robust. So we're going to get a little bit more into that. But Akeen, I wanted to focus for a minute on who needs to own or hold the CVI license? Because that's a really important yeah. part of this conversation. Yeah, and this is, I think, like an important question that, that people have that they kind of understand from a licensing standpoint and from a module standpoint, what's really needed, you know, to implement the system successfully, depending on which platform that they choose. So the, the, the general rule is, you know, whoever creates the call is the one who needs to hold, own the CVI license. So what that means is if I am a, am a Zoom house, and I create a Zoom call, and I want non-Zoom calls to join me, then I have to own CRC, which is the which is the interop for Zoom. It allows other people from other platforms to join my Zoom call. Likewise for Teams, if I'm a Teams house and I create a Teams call and I'm inviting other people to that Teams call, then I need either Poly or Pexip in order to do the translation from those other platforms into my team's call. And that's kind of how to think about it. He or she who creates the call, they need to own the CBI for that specific platform. So I hope that makes it kind of clear because it, it took me a little while to kind of to wrap that around my head because you know everybody That'd else- That'd be a little bit confusing, too. yeah. Yeah. So. And it probably is still confusing, even though I think you give a perfect explanation. Right, right, right. <laughs> Luckily, uh, we can record this and watch it back. Yeah. Well, exactly. So the key here, I'll just say it again for clarity's sake, mm -hmm. to a Zoom CRC enables other platforms to join a Zoom call. Yeah. A team CRC enables other platforms to join a Teams call. Mm -hmm. So my thought nowadays is that if I'm going to be creating Teams invites and I want to be able to send them to anyone and not worry about how they're going to join the call, I want to have the CVIs for my Teams calls. So, and the other clarification here is that CVIs are really for room systems. There, it, it does apply to a lesser extent to the software or the VC app you're running on your laptop. But the baseline is I have 50 or 100 WebEx rooms. I just want to join my Zoom calls. Yes, you can do that. Use a Zoom CRC. Mm -hmm. I have 100 Poly rooms or Polycom rooms from back in the day. Yes, you can do that at a Zoom CRC or a team CRC. But the, as Akeen said, the clarification is the person sending the meeting invite has to be the one who has that CVI. And it's not an individual. I don't personally need to own it. My company needs to own it. Right. And then it becomes associated with everyone in my company when they create a Teams invite. The details for that CVI are in the invite or the same thing for the other platforms right. to enable them to cross talk with one another. Um, but let's get in a little bit about what each of these rooms can join today. Uh, James, do you want to start us off on this one? Sure. sure. So for Zoom, um, Zoom can join the Microsoft Teams in WebEx with the CVI. And um, it's interesting because Zoom, I guess, were the first to sort of come up with this feature or concept because they, they had to come along and play with the big guys who, you know, basically set their own rules, right? Um, so... I yeah, guess back in the day it was Tamburg and it was Polycom and then they decided, okay, well, we're going to talk and things were more consistent back then than they are today. I know. Yeah. Cause it was just down to the protocol rather than, um, their, their, you know, closed shop sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then how about the WebEx room? So yeah, WebEx can join, uh, the MS teams and zoom with the CVI. So it sort of flips around. Um, and then obviously teams, um, that's a bit more, convoluted i guess uh because you can join uh we're making zoom calls but you need you know via microsoft what's the acronym stand for again ben it's a so it, it's the technology access program meaning you have to be part i think of it as beta right right um so if you have a teams room today it is the most limited in terms of what else you can join it's only been barely two months since uh teams announced partnership with webex in terms of if oh, someone with the newest, latest, and greatest WebEx versions sends out invites, you can have native interoperability from a Teams room. Right. 
they are doing the same thing with Zoom only if you're part of the Microsoft tap. And we don't know, is it going to be a month? Is it going to be 12 months or more until a team room can join a Zoom room for everyone? Like it doesn't yeah. exist today. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And even at just at the beginning of this year, it was Microsoft Teams was very closed off to the rest of the world, you know. Um, There's been is, so much evolution of the technology here in the past nine months. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's become much more competitive. So, yeah. Which is good. Yeah. So let's just talk about how do you go about making the decision in terms of what type of room you might build? It's complicated. So, from my conversations with clients over the past number of months, there's more and more people migrating towards a primarily Microsoft Teams. They're mm. still using the other platforms as well, but there's many more people asking the question, I'm Microsoft Teams, but I want to join Zoom. And it's not really that simple today. It's going to get right. there, you know, and it's tough because I, I'm going to suggest that if you define your 90% use case, and if you're 90% Microsoft Teams, you build that type of room or WebEx or Zoom. And, it, and, but you still have to talk through the nuances of how often are you joining other platforms and how important are those calls in yeah, terms of, is, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, James, how about this conversation here about interrupt does not equal native platform experience. I touched on it earlier, but do you have any more insight there? Like, yeah. So um, the native experience is, is as we sort of alluded to before of, um, having having that full functionality set from from that particular platform. So, the in, if you implement a interrupt license, you might not necessarily get all of those features, such as you know the mic mute um, that might not transpire to the the uh, you know if your um, Zoom uh, endpoint mutes, it might not show up on WebEx or vice versa. Um, so I don't know if that specific example is true, but... Um, but no, it is. That's a great example. So if yeah. I use the Zoom CRC and I'm in my Cisco WebEx room and I hit the mic mute on my Cisco mic on the table, the Zoom call is not going to... The other people on the Zoom call are not going to be able to see that I'm muted. Right, right. So that, and that's, that's the kind of example that we're talking about with, with the native uh, feature set um, crossing over. So yeah. Um, although, you know, interrupt allows the call, it, it's not, you know... Uh, the exact experience um, as yeah. if you're on the other platform. And so the next question is, what if interrupt, what if we decide the interrupt is not good enough? Meaning you're telling me that I'm going to lose features for the call type I'm joining. That's not good enough. <laughs> I'm not going to live with that. What can I do about it? And so part of the answer here is adding over BYOD, but Akeen, would you help us by defining BYOD, what does that mean? Yeah, well, BYOD is, you know, I think we, we've, we've all heard it before, you know, it's, it's bring your own device, you know, I think BYOM is also another acronym, bring your own meeting. Um, and you know that on your specific device on your laptop and running Teams natively, if you're running Zoom or, or WebEx on your laptop, and you don't want to lose any sort of that functionality, then, you know, when you typically come into a, a, um, a conference space, um, you now have like the option of actually interfacing with the peripherals in that space um, via USB and they can connect directly to your specific device. So, you know, when, um, you know, you're muting something, you know, uh, on your laptop, you know, it's going to actually translate um, and you don't have to worry about, you know, the translation that's going to happen with the CDI necessarily. Um, essentially, you're just basically, you know, expanding um, or just putting in a better mic, better camera. Um, probably a better speaker system with your own device as opposed to, you know, using what's on your device itself. Um, and you can just kind of bypass, you know, the interrupt altogether in that sort of instance. Or a CDI. And, I, and I think there's two yeah. ways to approach this, right? You're going to combine a room system with BYOD mm -hmm. or depending on your corporate culture, you could have purely BYOD. So if everyone is going to bring their own laptop to a meeting, it's a great solution, especially nowadays. And I know this is a whole other conversation, but there is fully wireless BYOD or BYOM where the system will send all of the camera and microphone and speakers to my laptop with no wired connection, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, today, we can't pair that fully wireless with a room system. You're going to have to have a USB cable to pair room, like a Microsoft Teams room with BYOD or a Zoom room with BYOD. And, and WebEx has offerings too. And this is also where we come back to the conversation of hardware 
and functionality mm-hmm. and and differences there. So the obvious example is a room kit mini from Cisco. You can connect a USB to my laptop and now my laptop is driving any call platform I want. Mm-hmm. And then these other examples here would be if I bought hardware from Poly, they allow a Zoom room to have BYOD. And then Crestron has hardware currently and it's gonna change quickly. Um, but they are offering currently a Microsoft Teams room with add-on BYOD. And I know that they said their roadmap is by the end of this year, all of their hardware have flavors of the different um, unified communications, what they we call for VC options to have BYOD layered on top mm-hmm. of your room system. So that is a great option to go down that path, um, but it still requires me to bring my laptop into a Teams room if I wanna draw in my Zoom call as the example. Yeah. Um, and then the other one here, James, let's start with you. <laughs> what if none of this is good enough? Where do we go from there? If I literally want one touch join from any platform? Yeah. And it, it's a valid, valid argument, right? Um, so luckily, um, quick launch have come up with some, uh, well, they offer a piece of software, um, that is, is a really versatile app that, that runs on the, the meeting room computer. And basically it allows you to to move between the different conferencing platforms as required. So, you know, uh, I want to have some Zoom calls and then I'm going to spend the next few hours on Teams calls. You can just basically swipe between them uh, in a seamless way, um, providing like a really very common user experience on the same uh, user interface. Um, so, and it, it basically just pairs with your calendars of, of the rooms and um, also provides like a, a one touch join. Um, and I think they support up to like 30 platforms or something like that. So, and fully customizable. So you, you can make it however you, you need it to, um, to align with what you've got existing or you can build it from scratch. So mm-hmm. um, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so that allows for that, you know, flexible kind of arrangement. Um, if you don't want to dedicate yourself to one or, you know, the majority of your rooms to one platform, you can do something like this and then you have access to all all platforms. Yep. And my opinion is that it's it's a very, very useful software package. I'm excited. Um, but it's not going to eliminate the Zoom rooms. It's not going to eliminate Teams rooms or WebEx rooms. It's just an alternate option. And we need to talk together and work towards what is the best option for me? What is the best option for my company, my company culture? Because it's never going to be one size fits all in terms of solutions. It's going to be customizable. And that's where we need to engage in conversations to understand what are the true needs of your end users. Right. If we don't understand the true needs, we're going to collectively deploy something that's not going to be truly useful and everyone's going to be disappointed. And I think like to that to that end, you know, <clears throat> you talk about what are the true needs. I mean, those needs are constantly evolving and changing, especially now over the course of the past six months. I can just think of a client that we had that primarily um, like a Cisco house. And more recently, um, they have actually decided to go to Polycom, um, you know, our, our Poly instead. You know, that's a huge overhaul, you know, because they're really trying to identify, you know, what's their current needs. You know, their needs from 10 months ago, it's not the same needs that they have today, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going through those 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 paces, um, and it's necessary. But you know, again, you know, you really have to kind of understand what you know that use case that that ninety percent use case. I feel like is is constantly shifting and it's constantly changing. We just have to kind of keep having those conversations with our clients to make sure that you know we're able to you know partner with them to be able to give them what they they really really truly need. You know? Yeah, and I think and there's people going the opposite direction as well. So I think for a lot of clients, a lot of large corporations out there. Anything is on the table right now because the use case has evolved in the past six months. There are people who had never done any type of video before. And now that they've learned it and getting ready to come back to work from the office, they need solutions because maybe it's no longer going to be 100% of your attendance in the building ever again. I don't think it will be. So the use case is going to continually evolve and it can and it will. Let's talk about future features. I know we touched on, on on some of these already, but James, why don't you start us off? What's coming? Um, yeah, so as, as we were speaking a little bit, um, Zoom Room is going to be able to join Teams calls. So that's that's a big, big jump. Um, so uh, they said- I know they said that it's currently in beta right now and their target was right. October. So that that's exciting. That means native. Right, yeah. And I'm hoping so, that means that less of the future, the feature differences 
or and, I should say the other way around. I hope right. they all work. <laughs> and, I, and I hope that that's, that's the flip side too. You know, if you, you know, you can zoom room can join um, zoom room to join team calls without a CBI that, you know, that that's, that's a competitive edge right there. So I would hope that you know, the other platforms will respond as well. I'm like, well, let's see if we can do it without a CBI as well, because that's just, just adding that additional, you know, uh, license and module, you know, it adds cost and it adds complexity, you know, so, you know, if, um, you know, teams and webinars can also kind of follow suit in terms of keeping things simple, you know, that's what we want to kind of provide for our clients. Anyway, we want to keep it as simple of an implementation as possible. And, and if we circle back real quick to the one touch join conversation, you can have one touch join with a CVI, but it's not going to happen natively out of the box. Right. I can load right. my poly, my PECSIP in CVI to my corporate system and allow people to join it, meaning like Zoom Rooms and WebEx. Mm -hmm. But unless I take the next step with the one touch join feature, which may or may not cost money, depending on which platform we go with, um, it still is another step. Mm -hmm. But that's the true usefulness of a video conferencing platform, whether it's native or interop, one touch join. I think and that's the, the key word there is usefulness because it's, it's great to have a feature, but if it doesn't make the an easier or more seamless experience, what's the point? Um, so yeah, having that native relationship would, would be, you know, game changing in a sense. Um, yeah. So we'll watch that space. You know? um, and then the next thing on the list here we have is the VC uh, fatigue prevention. So um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but it's something we're all familiar with now that we're uh, constantly on camera most of the day. Um, so together mode was that, you know, slightly odd feature that uh, you were talking about, Akeen. Um, but I think, you know, from, from teams, I think they're also just trying to um, provide a consistent experience too. So uh, I think by default, they, they sort of blur out the background behind all the call participants and try and uh, zoom in to, to create everybody's head to be the same size. Um, so providing a bit of a consistent experience. So, um, you know, you, 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 your eyes are trained to look at the person that's talking as opposed to looking at their background and seeing what kind of lampshade they've got. Um, so probably more focus on that. And, and as you said before, again, keeping things exciting, you know, as well. Um, so maybe different features are coming out. Um, higher participant limits. Um, so I think that goes towards the kind of thing we're doing here. So a, a webinar or a town hall, um, we're seeing uh, increased uh, limits to, I think, 3,000 is, is where Zoom are at now. And I think teams are working towards is it a 20,000 limit. Um, I'm not sure. That's a big number. Yep. Yeah. So that, that's pretty huge. But I think that's more for you know, your large, large, you know, corporate town hall kind of scenario. Um, otherwise, I'd hate to be on a meeting with uh, 20,000 people trying to talk at once. Um, so that's probably a listen only, but that's, that's a, an incredible um, people count or a participant count. Mm hmm. And then um, we've got uh, voice control for systems. Um, so that's, again, that's, that's going down the current path that we we've, we've should have been you know, forced into with this pandemic. Um, and so Zoom currently does that, right? So you can walk into a room and say, hey, Zoom, start my meeting. Um, and the iPad specific. Right. Sorry, yes, yeah. If, you, if, you, if you're in the Apple world, then that, that, that works seamlessly. So, and I've heard um, rumblings around Microsoft using Cortana for in the future for the Teams rooms. Right, right. So, um, yeah, and I think WebEx uh, are doing something similar to that, right? With the voice control bend. Well, yeah, so if you, at the baseline, if you en enable the WebEx assistant, you can click the box that says voice control. So that'll, that'll be the same thing. Hey, WebEx, start my meeting. And, and that works today. Yeah. But let's yeah. talk about this AI feature here, James. That sounds Yeah, so uh, that's, that's kind of interesting. So uh, the WebEx Assistant, they're calling it, um, is basically a facial recognition tool um, that's basically going to be helped to manage a call. So the example would be the room, room uh, a person is in a room, uh, the face of the person is scanned with the, with the room's camera. And then that is compared to the corporate database cross reference to any, any calendar entries for upcoming meetings. And then with the positive result, the person in the room is then prompted if they want to start the call or not. Hey, um, James, would you like me to start your 11 a.m. Yeah. meeting? I say, hey, robot. <laughs> yeah, sure, let's go. It's, um, it's exciting no, and scary at the same time. I don't know which to think more. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, I guess, yeah, it's obviously designed with the intent of being helpful, but it, it, it could be 
you know, not helpful at the same time. Who knows? Um, yeah. But that's probably something we're going to see more of because that is essentially the absolute no no touch join of a, of a meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, we have to watch that space too. So I think that to sum things up here, there's features from all three, three platforms that look similar and they are very similar, but there's many, many levels of nuance here. And so one platform is going to be perfect for one company and the other platforms will be perfect for others. And so we're going to continue this evolution and the solution that you deploy today may be very different than what you see 12 months from now. And obviously it's very different than what we saw 12 months ago in the past. We're gonna continue down this path and it's critical that we continue the conversations so that we can be ready to deploy the best solution for the individual or the corporate individual. And I wanna roll things over to Bill here to see if we have any questions that we can answer Cool. Thanks, Ben. Um, before we start the Q&A, just a quick reminder, everybody, that if you have a question or want more detail, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, to get this started, I want to ask about something that we're hearing more about that somebody posted, um, certified devices. Can you expand on what it means to be a certified device? Yeah, yeah I, I can, I can oh, talk sorry. about that a little bit. About, so yeah, um, just, and I can give a more specific example you know, with regards to that. Um, you know, we have a client that was putting in Logitech taps, um, for instance, and, uh, you know, we had to be very, very careful about which specific DSPs that we were choosing and microphones. And you can go to every, every single, um, you know, one of these platforms, they have a list of certified devices, you know, Microsoft Teams certified devices, Zoom certified devices, and so forth. Um, so um, with this specific example, with, with, um, with a Logitech tap, you needed to have a specific buy-up DSP and their EFGBT in order to get mute syncing properly. Um, so, you know, with regards to micro to certified devices, you do need to pay very close attention to the devices that you're pairing up with room based systems for each of these different platforms so that you can have that sort of consistent experience kind of going across it. James, I know you were going to say something. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, basically, the same thing you were going to say. No, you summed it up pretty well there. Yeah. And I'll just right. add that if I have a problem, if my devices are certified, the hardware manufacturer has an inherent responsibility and interest in working with the platform provider to support me. If I go pick random things off of the shelf, it's my problem and I have to deal with it by myself. All right, the next one is more recommendation and not a question. And I wanted to see if you guys wanted to comment. Um, Would recommend that if a company deploys Zoom, the IT department should make Zoom desktop as a part of their normal build so they can monitor updates and then users can share easily when in a Zoom room. Well, that makes sense because any corporate entity has a baseline of software applications that they roll out by default. So if I'm adopting Zoom for my company for the very first time, I want my IT group to load that software, the application on everyone's laptop by default. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, The next is from an architect, if I recognize the name right. Um, May tie into your conversation, and I think it may tie into your conversation regarding the 90% use case. Um, many clients have already initiated return to work plans for a percentage of their staff, and many others are in the process of implementing similar RTS plans. What technology slash platforms provides, provide the most equitable experience for both the in-room participants in the office and those participating remotely, for, uh, for example, home? I don't think that's an easy question. I think that one of the features that these platforms do not offer natively is the ability to give everyone an equal footing in the call. So right now we can see myself and Akeen and James and Bill on camera, but if we had three people in a conference room, they would all appear smaller on this call. Zoom doesn't do anything about this and neither do the other players. One of the add-on features that you could purchase or we could sell would be from Pexip. And I think that's still in beta, and I forget the exact terminology, but they're effectively analyzing the faces in a call and making everyone the same size. And so if there's a conference room with three people, they would put that image larger. And if I'm sitting at home all by myself, it'll make me smaller, but it does allow for a better engagement of your audience because I can see everybody better instead of having three people at a, t- if a conference room, they're half the size or less of, of a Keen or a James. Now, and what I, I would just add to that too, that this is something that's probably outside of the purview of what we're discussing here just a little bit, but you know, this may be something that some of these different platforms need to explore in terms of 
some more like immersive type of technologies that do give more of an equal footing that you're kind of describing and talking about. And I don't know if if what's in the, the the pipeline with regards to more immersive type experiences, you know, like a VR or AR type of thing where people can kind of join and feel like they're more a part of the call. But that's something that, you know, that I would love to see some of these different platforms. I know that Teams has some has done some stuff like volumetric video and so forth, where you can kind of almost like a hologram type of thing, see somebody actually um, visibly like in a call or in a meeting or presenting. But that's not something that it, that I think these platforms have, you know, fully implemented or, or I don't even know what's in there on, in the um, on the um, in their pipeline in order to, to, to provide those sort of features. But but that's I think you know to kind of answer that question it would be really cool to see some of that sun some of that uh, that functionality kind of coming into play for some of these platforms. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, is PTZ control now available in MS Teams? I understood that it wasn't quite ready yet. I think we forgot to say that earlier, but yeah, it's still not. True. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> although you can add it with a custom page, right? You... It's pretty easy to add, but it, 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 it requires a little bit more hardware. Right. And depending right. on the complexity of your system, it may be, I, I mean, ideally it's one page flip to get into it, um, but depending on your needs, it could be two pages deep. So possible, but but not native, not not out of the box. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the follow up. Uh, the, excuse me. The next question I think is a follow up to the people counting. So does MS Teams not offer people counting? Not that I've seen yet, uh, and yeah. hopefully I'm wrong at some point. Whether it's now or a month from now, I'm sure it's coming. And and what I would add to that too is like for for systems that don't offer it natively, you still have like IoT devices um, that can actually you know, people count in a room, they can take the temperature, you know, they can do, they can check for air quality. I know there's a, a sharp, um, I think that their WCD board, you know, it comes with the option of having an IOT device along with the typical peripherals in terms of the sound bar and the camera and the, and the, and the microphone array. And that IOT device can people count. So there are, there are other ways, you know, for platforms that don't have it natively built in, um, the people counting, you can introduce like an IoT device that can pass off information to say like a fusion system. It can tie in on the back end um, using like um, you know Amazon services or Microsoft services uh, to pass that information along to. And if I were going to seriously go down the path of people counting to make sure that everyone is safe in my building, I wouldn't be relying on one of these platforms to do it. I would. There are plenty of other great solutions that are f very robust and can fully tie into your building management systems, whether that's from AV in terms of us doing Crestron Fusion or something like that, or a variety of other solutions. All right, next question. My company has provided backgrounds to use in Teams. Can I somehow use those backgrounds in Zoom or WebEx? That's funny because I was thinking about doing it myself. So this, the short answer is yes. You can upload custom backgrounds into all three of these platforms and just in image files. And then if we need, we can have side conversations about the specifics of the process to go through that. All right, the next one I think is more a comment. There are other USB cameras, Logitech, et cetera, that have auto framing, Aver, even one beyond has a lower cost option. If we're comparing to Cisco, yes, absolutely. There are lots of options out there. One of the things that I started and didn't finish yet is I am planning a, a camera shootout to track all, well, to track, to test out the auto framing or auto tracking be between a variety of these cameras. Because one of the things, there's some that I like because they're fast and some are slower. And so there's a balance between feeling frustrated. Why did it not frame faster? Or if it's too crazy, it'll make people feel seasick. Um, one of the options that's, that's not fully released yet is their target, the company's targeting user selectable from the back end, fast, medium, and slow for the tracking. And I think that would be nice to have that adjustment. All right, the next one, um, it, this is from a partner of ours in Southeast Asia. Thank you for joining uh, so late this evening. Um, very good info. Which platform has the best encryption? Mm -hmm. I'll start off with this one too, if you guys don't mind. Um, <laughs> I don't really have a definitive answer here. So obviously Zoom has come a long way <laughs> in the past five months and made a number, a number of changes. Yesterday I was on a call talking with a Cisco rep 
And I said to that person, well, one of my clients said that they're thinking about moving away from Cisco towards Zoom because Zoom is more secure from his perspective. And the rep said, well, first off, that's crazy. No, obviously this is the Cisco perspective speaking. Um, and I know that the client's perspective is that they have more individual adjustments that they can control through Zoom than they have in WebEx. That's different than encryption, meaning encryption would be who's going to break into my call and get, say, insider trader information because I wasn't secure. It's not the same thing as Zoom bombing. That's very different. There's easy ways to prevent that. McKean or James, do you have anything to add here? <laughs> um, not I, really. I don't. I don't. Um... I don't have anything to add. <laughs> and I guess I would say the Zoom <laughs> made the decision up front to make things easy at the risk of secure. And that can mean a variety of different things. They've yeah. since changed a lot of that. But I would still argue that Microsoft and Cisco have been doing this a really long time. And yeah. if it just comes down to trust of security, I would go with those guys. Right. And I think first. that's the only thing that I would add is that Microsoft, you know, they've got the pedigree of, of and, and the history um, so, you know, in a complete Microsoft ecosystem, that's probably pretty just as secure as, as Cisco. All right, next question. Is there native interop for VC platforms running on my laptop? Well, two ways to look at this on your laptop. Um, one would be you can run every single individual VC app on your laptop. You can join from a browser for any VC solution platform, but maybe the question also is, could be tied into calendar integration because it can be a little kludgy to go to Outlook and then click, oh, double click your meeting and then find where in that meeting to join a button. And like one of the options that I played with a little bit that I ultimately didn't use is a little software called Meter and you give it your calendar credentials and it reads your calendar and it gives you a one-click join for most of the platforms that I test out. And it's not perfect, but it is a bit easier than Outlook. And that was M-E-E-T-E-R. It was just free to download. All right, next question. Can two native platforms be combined into one system? That sounds like a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the short answer is no, absolutely not. <laughs> um, if I'll evolve that question a little bit and say, can I have a Zoom room and a Teams room using the same hardware at the same time? No. There's a lot of hardware options out there that can do one at a time, but it's not going to be a button press to flip from Zoom room to Microsoft Teams room. You know, at the very least, if you're really, really fast and you have IT support behind you, it's a five to 10 minute swap between a Teams room and a Zoom room, but it's never something you'd want to do between calls. And I guess the other answer here is we were talking before about the software called Quick Launch. And that's not a Teams room. That's just an open computer with many, many customizable, fe customizable features that does give you a one-click join to all of the platforms. But it would look just like Zoom on your laptop, not, not Zoom, not a Zoom room. Uh, and uh, you, you just pulled it right out. The next question and the last question was, can you give more information on the Quick Launch software you mentioned? <laughs> Short story, <laughs> open computer. <laughs> it's a software overlay. It could be on your main screen or you can pair it with like a touch panel. And my preference would be to force it to run only on the separate touch panel. And then it'll look at your calendar. It'll read the calendar and say, Ben's meeting 12 o'clock Zoom, give you a join button. It'll even give you the Zoom logo or any of the logo of any of the other 30 platforms. But it's very customizable so that I can join the meeting as Ben. I could join the meeting as the conference room anything you want. I know that's not the greatest description, but that's a bigger conversation to answer the question. All right, great. Um, be mindful of time. Thank you, James. Thank you, Akeen. Thank you, Ben. Really appreciate your time and your insight today. I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. And we hope you found this session very valuable. Uh, the recorded replay will be available within the next few days, and we'll share the recording and the presentation with you when we have it posted. If you have any follow-up questions or have a topic you'd like us to consider for our next webinar, which I think we're planning for early to mid-November, um, uh, please feel free to email me directly at bchamberlain at barracks.com, or you can connect with any of us on LinkedIn. Thank you, everybody. Hope you had a great day. Please stay healthy and uh, take care. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.